Okay, uh, call to order the uh, city council meeting, uh, seven o'clock, and um, we've already done uh, Pledge of Allegiance. No, that's up. Okay, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have a presentation from the Santa Cruz County Youth Violence Prevention Task Force. This is an update. Hi. Good evening. It was on. There we go. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yep. Good.
just say before I see if you guys have any questions for me about it, uh, just in terms of how it was effective with Capitola, one of the takeaways for me is um, I'm really, really proud to see that we actually work really well with our community, that we, we seem to flow well and support, support the community, the community just supports law enforcement. Um, other, other folks are struggling, having different struggles. And so it's, I'm glad that we're all coming together and talking about it. Our county is really actually pretty small. So, um, but it was really, I was really, really proud to see that, you know, we're moving in the direction that we are. And from here, we're now in the, in the place where we're discussing how to take those three main goals and launch them forward. And in, in that kind of brainstorming phase and looking at realistically, what do we have the funding for? Um, you know, what's gonna work and, um, and who are all of our participants. Okay, great. Questions? Any questions? Sam. Yeah. Thank you, Sergeant Ryan. Um, um, my question was one of the topic ideas was about shifts in uh, policies and practices uh, for the police force. And I was just wondering what some of those changes were brought up and discussed and that you may be bringing back for our consideration. one, which was um, increased in educational opportunities and information right. sharing. A lot of what, we only had a certain amount of time at that last meeting, and there was a lot of people there. And a lot of the community members don't actually know how our training has progressed mm -hmm. over the years. So um, the, I, I'm, you have to let me know if I'm not answering your question right, but they, they wanted to know how our policies so I, I basically looped those together, and that's one of the things I brought back as we came to be in the second phase, because a lot of that we covered in us sharing. People don't know how we've changed to doing um, a lot of intensive training about mental health issues, recognizing what that looks like, um, de-escalation training. The, those are things that maybe didn't happen a decade ago, but they're happening now, and the public just isn't aware. Sure. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I just have a comment, I have a okay. question. What's that noise? Uh, it's the maintenance. Oh, is that what it is? I was like, what is that noise? Oh, right, <laughs> I was wondering why you did that. Um, well, thank you for being here. I was at the last meeting um, where I got to listen to the outcomes um, and I was really excited, uh, exciting to, to hear the group so excited or themselves about the implementation of, of these steps. Um, one thing that came up, you or uh, like you mentioned, is that there is a lot of, um, everyone's really happy with our police force here in Capitola. You do a, a tremendous job. Um, one thing I'd like to learn more about is what sort of tools are you using to train staff in dealing with the folks that don't live here? We're a tourist community. Many people come to visit us. Um, and so you mental, mentioned the mental health training or the de-escalation. So if anything comes up or if you do any other trainings, that's just something that I could use as a resource when talking to uh, community members about what, what you all do. Yeah. I just have a comment, Ms. Summers' question. I, I just, Sarah, I just wanna thank you for what you do. I think anything we do to encourage and continue dialogue is fabulous, it's very difficult these days, it's challenging, so the fact that you're making that bridge, I think this is a fabulous program. Thanks for your efforts. So I was there too, and I was very impressed with the, um, I guess the power of the group discussions. Um, there must have been an immense amount of commitment because these went over, uh, I forgot how many weeks, but it was for a long period of time, and the reports out, I think, were pretty good. So this technique, I think, is viable one. Is there any plans to continue it and use it on a regular basis as uh, people become more involved in trying to work on youth violence issues? There is. Um, there, there is talk about continuing with, with the group. Um, there's also some talk about some how, how to restructure the facilitators because that is really key in, in driving a conversation that is productive and healthy. Because um, the idea isn't to um, you know, go 
focus on some of the, the perceived negatives of law enforcement versus the community. The idea is to bring it together. So that's really one of the things we're working on right now is how to have really uh, skilled facilitators that can extract useful information and then you know, we can move forward with I understand you work a lot with New Brighton. Is there any possibility that this could be used in New Brighton and get some ideas from that student body? Absolutely. In fact, we did that when we started at the very beginning. We, um, for, I personally went to New Brighton, and um, I, you know, for, for years of policing and parenting, I'm familiar with the staff there. Right. And so we, we together um, worked on you know, selecting some kids and finding out what they thought they needed. Right. Okay. Well, since it's just a report and an update, thank you very much, and um, appreciate your efforts. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, report on closed session. The city council reviewed both items on the agenda, and no action was taken. Thank you. Any additional materials? We have none. Okay. So additions and deletions to the agenda. Staff has no changes. Okay. Now is the time for public comments. Anyone in the audience who would like to speak, you have three minutes for any item not on the agenda. And if you'd like to state your name for the record, you may. You don't have to. Thank you, Shirley. Okay, anyone else? Okay, bringing it back to City Council for comments. Ed's taking a deep breath. This is scary. It's fire. <laughs> okay. Is it City Council comments? I'm sorry. What yeah, City oh. Council comments right now. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to, in light of the holiday the, uh, on Thursday, I just want to take a moment to thank all the staff that come out on rainy days and show up to all these meetings. I really appreciate all of you, and I just wanted to say thank you. Well, and, and I, I also wanted to uh, wish everyone out there viewing within hearing range uh, happy holidays. May you spend it with those you love and be in good health. So happy Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, but now the comment, this is uh, for our finance director. Um, I'd like to add an item for the fact to, cont uh, to uh, I guess, look into, and that is transfer tax. And um, I won't be on the FAC uh, next year, so I want to bring that up right now. Um, also, this meeting is Cablecast Live on Charter Communications TV uh, Channel 8, and it's also being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday, the following first rebroadcast on one, again on Channel uh, Ch uh, Charter Chapel 71, Channel 71, and Comcast uh, 25. We also record it if you go to our website. And that's it for me. Any city staff comments? I don't think staff has any comments this evening. Larry, are you getting up to make one? No. no. We're, we're, <laughs> we're closely monitoring the creek. That's the news of the day right now to see when we might open. We're hoping we're going to get it open in the next three days. I don't think tonight's going to happen, but I probably just jinxed it. Okay. City clerk? Oh, Ed. Steve, I hate to make you get up, but I, I see these new pads being poured in, poured in the uh, in the village. Are we expanding the pay stations, or what's going on there? Thanks. We're coming to that point where we're trying to get rid of all the singles. I saw, I saw them. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> we'll have breakthrough. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, okay. Let's go on to regular um, agenda items. Consent calendar. Anyone on the council would like to pull an item? Okay, seeing none, anyone in the audience would like to pull an item? Seeing none, is there a motion? I'll move consent. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So passes, thank you. Let's go on to general government and public hearings. Special event highlights, item A, 9A. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Bertrand, and Council members and staff. I'm, I'm here this evening to provide my report of the 2019 special events. This, uh, my goal this evening is to highlight this year's events, answer any questions, and re receive direction from Council uh, for the coming year. For 2019, we had 10 general events and 36 minor events. Uh, general events require Council approval, and minor events are approved by the City Manager. The difference between general and minor events are, are the projected attendees 
and the impact on city services. Typically, any event with more than 200 attendees and um, are considered general events. Uh, for this year, no new general events were added, and three minor events were added. And those included three capital village safety controls, uh, the state Tola, and the Monterey Park Free Trust Day. Some of the historical general events include the pa Capitol Public Safety Car Show, the Wharf and Wharf Race, Art and Wine Festival, and the Monty Fireworks. This year was the second annual Beach Festival, which re replaced the Laguna Festival. Um, also this year, the Jay Race was canceled by the event organizer, which was a general event. The most notable change for this year was the addition of security personnel that was funded by the organizer. The police department staff met with the event organizers prepared a safety plan including the use of security personnel at the traffic control points in such territories. This allowed for better allocation of city staff, particularly those of the police officers. Staff refined our approach by pre-establishing an incident command structure, which is commonly referred to as the ICS. And the police department assigned a supervisor or sergeant to act as the incident commander for each general event. By doing so, this pre-establishing the ICS structure allowed for city resources to complement, not compete with one another. After action reports were prepared following each general event and no major issues were raised, on average during the general events where we did significant towing, uh, it was about four vehicles per general event. The highest amount of vehicles towed was from the work and work, and that was 10 vehicles. Only a few calls for service were noted during all the events, and I'm happy to, to, to announced that we, we made actually no arrest specifically related to the general events. Um, the city billed a total of 340 hours, which uh, included, which was 250 hours of police personnel and, and 90 hours of public works. Uh, this re represented an increase of 17%, 17%, and all the costs were reimbursed by the event organizers. So in summary, this was a very successful year, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions. Yeah, uh, Sergeant Daly, uh, Captain Daly, I'm sorry. Um, the uh, the new events, this uh, sip and stroll, has there been any problems with those or has that been something that's just uh, seems to blend right in? Uh, no, no significant problems over the counter. They're, they're dealt with as a, as a minor event, so they're not general events. Um, there's no uh, significant road closures. Like I said, the, the uh, BIA was the one that brought this forward. It's been a trend. I know that they have them in Sotel Village um, and then Capitola Village. Like I said, they had three this year. Um, but there wasn't an, a, a significant impact. There was just it was more so uh, bridging the gap between the seasons. So they'll have them in the kind of the falls, winters, and then spring. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've heard very little uh, complaints from residents about the events, even though we have many events, and I think a lot of them make what Capitola what it is. Um, some of them, uh, the, one, the complaints I do hear are generally around amplified sound early in the morning, uh, and particularly with um, certain music that is played and amplified very early in the morning. I guess some people don't like heavy metal at 8 a.m. Um, if that occurs. But do we have some ability or in our um, um, permits to um, indicate that they're, they're not to play really loud amplified sounds early in the morning or maybe if they do have music? Because I understand, yeah, the music helps get people going and especially on the runs and things but maybe something that's um, not as alarming for the locals here that maybe uh, are trying to sleep nearby. Uh, absolutely. We do have controls that are pretty parameters on what, uh, what, Good. We can, what we want for special events. I know that we made that shift with, um, I believe it was one of the triathlons where they played the music and they had the speakers actually facing towards the, the Esplanade, and, and so the adjustment was that we said, no, you know, turn them out, and then we put higher restrictions on that, so that's absolutely Right, so good, we, good. We yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, I think that aside from that, um, it seems like most people who live here and as well that are attending, um, they really enjoy the events. I think it's healthy for the community, and, and thank you, uh, Captain Daly, for 
you know, being a part of making all these uh, events very successful, uh, and particularly the skate tola. I want to give a thumbs up for that and hope to see that again. So, yeah. Wonderful. Good. Thank you. No questions for me. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's move on to item B, uh, Senate Bill 2, Housing Grant Resolution. Good evening, Mayor Patron and Council Members. Um, before you tonight is an exciting opportunity for the City of Capitola. Um, the SB2 housing grants are currently open for applications. And this came about in 2017 as part of the 15-bill housing package for the housing crisis. Um, within SB2, there was an established fee that was connected to real estate transactions of $75. And those funds have been adding up. And for the, fir for the first year of um, establishing the grants, half of that money is going towards municipalities so that they can um, help accelerate and facilitate housing projects within cities. So the city of Capitola, due to our size, we can get up to $160,000 for a housing grant. Um, the criteria is that our plan must include um, either a plan or a process that will actually accelerate housing production. And that can be done through different means of timing and cost, um, feasibility, uh, increasing your infrastructure capacity for more housing, um, and any impacts on housing supply and affordability. Within the grant application, there are six items which would are almost automatic approvals that they identify, and those include rezone to permit by right. That's something we're doing regardless of the, the grant money. We'll be updating our zoning code for ADUs to reflect the new um, standards. Three new laws were passed this past legislative session and those will uh, go into f effect January 1st and I've been working closely with Sam on updating our ordinance. So we'll br be bringing that back in early January. Um, of this list, the two items that I would suggest that the City of Capitola uh, apply for are one, creating objective design and development standards to be consistent with SB 35 and I have a few slides on that. Um, and also utilizing the money for accessory dwelling units. With the new laws that are in place, dwelling ADUs can be approved administratively. The um, guidance is very uh, prescriptive in the new laws. And I was thinking we could utilize this money to create our own, um, I'll go to the next slide. Um, we could streamline ADU production through pre-approved site and architectural plans. So we could actually put out a bid for um, local designers, architects, and we can, uh, I with the money, there's, uh, with $160,000, we could probably get four architects um, in, in order to create four different standards. We could look at our standard lot sizes and what would fit within a rear yard and um, create pre-approved site and architectural plans. And then also developing informational materials for the public, so really enhancing our public outreach in terms of our website and making the process really easy in terms of getting the word out there on how easy it's become over time. Um, the more technical part of this is um, the SB 35. So this SB 35 was also part of the 15, um, the 2017 package for the housing updates. And what SB 35 does is it's a str it streamlines housing development for mixed use as well as multi, well, multi-unit and mixed use developments, as long as the mixed use development has at least two thirds housing. All applications must be approved ministerially, meaning they cannot go before a public hearing, and they must be processed within 60 to 180 days. Um, in, in reviewing an SB 35 application, the city is only allowed to apply objective design standards and I'll get into that a little bit more, but this is what that, uh, the money would be utilized for is to update our zoning code to make sure we have objective design standards. And SB 35 is applicable to any city that has not met their RENA allocation numbers, the regional housing need allocation numbers. So this slide shows you what we have for our RENA numbers in Capitola. Uh, the first column is the goals 
the second column is the number of units developed. As you can see, we have one moderate unit that sets that 38th Avenue complex. We would have had the number, we would have had three here if Claire's Street had been developed, the two density bonus applications, but that they withdrew their application. So um, out of our 60 above moderate, this is just your typical housing, not deed restricted. We're up to 49, so we're 11 units away from meeting our above moderate numbers. So hoping to see a lot of improvement in our numbers with the mall redevelopment project. I think we've got a real opportunity there to get our numbers up. But interesting within SB 35, if you haven't met your above moderate numbers, there's a requirement that the applicant only bring in 10% of the um, project that would have to be affordable. If you've met your above moderate number, so if we were at the 60, then the requirement would be that any, develop, any developer under SB 35 would need to bring in 30, uh, 50% of the units as affordable units. So you probably are less likely to see an SB 35 application once we've met our above moderate. Um, or we'd get a great project with a whole lot of afford affordable housing in it. So um, eligible products under SB 35, the criteria is that they must meet their urban infill. So three, three sides of the property must have already been developed. Um, there must be at least two units within the development. Again, we have to have, they can only be reviewed under objective zoning, subdivision, and design review standards. They're not applicable in the coastal zone, so two-thirds of our city would not, this wouldn't apply to, but it would be applicable out on 41st Avenue, um, North Capitola Road. And what where SB 35 cannot take place is in an area that already has rent restrictions and price controls if the housing has been occupied by tenants within the past 10 <coughs> years and within historic structures. So that also doesn't leave many opportunities, but our mall site would be subject to this as well as a future mixed use site within our regional commercial zone and, and community commercial. And the other part is that within SB 35, they must pay prevailing wages. So another hurdle for uh, developers. So objective design standards are standards that involve no personal or subjective judgment by a public official and are available to the public. An example of that, uh, many of our guidelines are kind of similar to the guidelines on the left, on the left that talks about articulation to reduce the apparent massing of a building and to be sensitive or compatible with the neighborhood. We've got a lot of that in our code. An example of an objective design standard is it sets um, parameters that anyone could read and know exactly what's expected. So for every 100 feet of building length, there shall be a plane break along the facade comprised of an offset of at least five feet in depth by 25 feet in length. Um, the offset shall extend to grade to the highest story. Uh, you also see many like standards for how much window openings have to be along a facade and differences for commercial versus residential. So that's what um, would change. We'd be going through our standards and in the design standards that are kind of fluffy like the one on the left, we'd be making them more prescriptive like the example on the right. So the recommended action tonight is to consider the resolution approving Senate Bill 2 planning grant application for the current grant cycle. And that would include public outreach and pre-approved site and architectural plans for accessory dwelling units and objective design standards consistent with SB 35. Um, one other thing I meant to mention on this, for the ADUs, we would take those, the design to the, um, not just to show exactly what the building would look like, but actually to the point that they could be submitted for building plans. So really taking that extra cost away from the applicant. They wouldn't just have what the design's gonna look like and what the site layout is, but it'll actually be able to be, other than them putting it on their site plan so it fits, um, it should be approvable. So at the level of building permit, Submittal. So, with that, I any questions? Questions, Sam. The pre-approved plans would those be optional? Yes. Okay. Um, would they come in different colors? Yes. So in, we wouldn't regulate color. They could choose their own colors, but 
I, I was imagining that we could have a couple different styles from different architects that people could choose. And they could probably change out at their expense, you know, what the finished materials are if they prefer a different finish. I do have a question. Um, a lot of discussion about the cost for permits. Is there any issue here that's uh, going to be provided for? They try to, you know, this is really loud. <laughs> um, for ADUs, for instance, no, since we want to encourage ADUs to, you know, assume the cost of permits, that kind of thing. Can so this grant um, cover that cost you for know, permits? We Part of the grant can look at how to reduce your costs regarding permits. We've done that through, um, our, our permit is just administrative. I and right. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact figure on hand for the, our permit right now, but, the, it, but it does cost when you come in for a building permit to go through the building permit review. Okay. Um, so but that would be the intent behind this, is we'd be able to short circuit a lot of our costs. At the end of the day, though, it. yeah, I mean, the key is, is not going to hearing is a mm -hmm. huge cost savings, and that's probably the largest piece that people would save. But the largest cost that anyone's going to pay with an ADU is not on our part, but is on the water district's part. And that's something we don't have control over. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. and but, yeah. it, it, some cities have impact fees that are assessed <coughs> on ADUs, and those can be three to ten thousand dollars cities after the new legislation are reducing them or even waiving them but you don't have those and so it's actually less expensive to build an ADU in Capitol than it is in a lot of communities already okay so I guess I didn't phrase it too well um, you did explain it's going to reduce the cost because of design and such like that plug-and-play almost in a sense but um, if we're going to in encourage ADUs if, if this grant can include provisions to actually reduce it to zero, you know, or maybe a water permit, you know, we have to pay for the water permit, that kind of thing. Okay, so the grant will not cover those types of costs. It will I not. actually reached out and talked to a representative today and it really has to be something that you're strategizing to improve in your process or another way in which to do this would be okay. to, th there was one um, section that talked about form-based codes and CEQA processes in, w in which you would go into a specific area of your town uh, say if we did this um, around, we'll just say Gales, we could create a specific, like re almost like a redevelopment area, but um, a form-based code that would prescribe exactly what could be built in that area, and then we would pass, get approved the CEQA documents tied to that development, and therefore they would have an administrative process of review for redevelopment of that area, and that um, saves money on a plan so it either has to be a process or a plan, but it cannot be to diminish the costs of, okay. like to, to take our costs of what it takes for us to review the application. So it, it's really for um, cities. It's it's money for cities to use to incentivize development, essentially, okay. by individuals. It's not necessarily for individuals to reduce their costs. The impacts of the city and. Reworking its own will procedures less. will reduce the, the developer's it. cost, but the grant isn't necessarily for individuals to offset their costs. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I have a question. You bet. Um, should we get this this grant and you, we move forward with creating those plans mm -hmm. with the four, four was it three or four um, plans for the the houses or the ADUs? Where would we have to update our, like, is it going to be a requirement for folks who apply for the ADU? And if so, where would we include that language and would that come back to council for approval? So our ADU ordinance will be updated come this January. Mm -hmm. um, the past two years, we've, we've been updating our ADU and um, ordinance regularly because there's been so many changes yeah. at the state level. So there could be an impact there. Like the new code, um, the new law says there's got to be a four foot setback from this side and rear lot lines. If that were to change, hopefully it wouldn't impact um, these AD, you know, the pre approved ADUs. The one thing that would have to change over time is within, if, if they're ready to go under and meet the building code, every three years our building code is updated. Mm -hmm. So that's something that in three years we'll probably want to make sure we have some type of funding that we could update these ADUs to meet building code. And we could probably work with our building official on that to make that happen. And 
And just for clarification, there's an opt out option for folks, or do they have to use one of those? Oh, n no, so they wouldn't okay. have to use one of these. Okay. They could it's have their own designer, saving. build Got their it. own ADU that is special to them, and this is just an add-on option, so. Okay, yep. thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, anyone in the audience like a question? No, seeing none, is there a motion here? I move we approve the resolution. Second. Second, so it's been approved and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So let's move on to item C. You're up again, I guess. Another fun one. Yeah. Sorry, no zoning code tonight. But <laughs> yeah. This is just as good. New Year. What is a zoning code update? <laughs> okay. Um, Next, we're going to discuss the sidewalk vending ordinance. I brought this to you this July, actually, and, and we talked about what type of vending ordinance would be appropriate for the city of Capitola. And the direction I was given is to just ensure the protection of public safety within the new zoning ordinance. So we've taken your, your comments, and um, I'll present to you the highlights of our new um, regulations for sidewalk vending. So our current Sidewalk vending ordinance is out of date. It talks about aesthetics, orderly movement of pedestrians, competition with local merchants, and it prohibits vendors within the central village. It's not comp in compliance with uh, SB 946, the statewide regulations for sidewalk vending. So what can be protected under SB, uh, under these regulations is public health, safety, and welfare. And then within our parks, we can also protect the public use and enjoyment of natural resources and recreational opportunities, and make sure that the commercial activities do not interfere with the enjoyment of the park's scenic and natural character. The regulations only apply to sidewalks, pathways, and parks. So if you see a sidewalk vendor and they're not located in a sidewalk, pathway, or park, then they're not allowed to be there. So good example, I think we've probably all driven by our railroad right of way and there's been a flower vendor out there and once we have this passed we'll be moving forward and it's you know but I in that scenario because uh, she hasn't been on a sidewalk she's got her good her wares located throughout someone else's private property it's an illegal activity under the new code um, she'd have to be holding her wares and um, located on a sidewalk yeah, ask a question about that because yeah, I've, I've noticed her and lovely flowers mm -hmm. by the way but uh, that's RTC property um, do we um, would we be enforcing um, we would. their rights or to not uh, you know not allow her to engage in that or anyone that's on the corridor so that technically I believe is um, is a like it's, it's, I think it's open space in our um, zoning map. I think it's green area. So it, you can't have a business operating in that space anyway. It's not in a commercial. And if you're in a commercial zone, you have to be in an enclosed building unless you have a special CUP for outdoor display of goods. So she's in conflict with the zoning code and should be in conflict because she's not on a sidewalk. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so within the new sidewalk vending ordinance, we set minimum sidewalk widths to ensure compliance with ADA of four feet citywide. And then within the Capitola Central Village, the minimum would be 10 feet, and this is due to the high pedestrian activity in the village. There are areas within the village that are wider than 10 feet. Um, so there would be opportunity. The minimum setbacks, we've set setbacks for safety standards. Um, such that from fire hydrants, crosswalks, driveways, um, alleys, entrances into parking areas, trash receptacles, bike racks, benches, and um, bus stops. There's also 100 feet from another sidewalk vendor or an emergency personnel. So if emergency personnel was out, uh, there have to be a 100 foot setback from any incident that was occurring and 100 feet from another sidewalk vendor. 
and then 200 feet from the police station, fire station, the Capitola Beach, farmers markets, swap meets, special events, and, and the school. Um, I did reach out to the uh, New Brighton School and they were happy with the 200 foot setback from the school. Within a city owned park, the city is not allowed to prohibit roaming vendors from operating within a city owned park, but we can prohibit a stationary vendor if there is an exclusive agreement with a concessionaire. Currently we don't have any exclusive agreements with concessionaires. We have the one um, surf shop that's allowed to sell out of Esplanade Park, but that's not considered an exclusive agreement with a concessionaire. That, that was, um, <laughs> they received a conditional use permit for that use and it's ongoing. Um, we're also allowed to protect the public's use and enjoyment of our natural resources and recreational opportunities. So for this, we've set a 200 foot setback from the Capitola Beach and also we prohibit um, the sa sidewalk vending on our pathways that are within close proximity of our natural resources. So the enjoyment of walking down SoCal Creek Pathway, Prospector Path, Depot Hill, Grand Avenue Pathway, and we included Lawn Way as well. You really have an experience there of being close to nature and you shouldn't be approached by someone selling flowers that might ruin your experience or selling anything. Um, so therefore we've set buffers. In our residential neighborhoods, we can treat residential a, a little bit differently than commercial. So in residential, we prohibited stationary sidewalk vendors. Um, and also hours of operation can be different between commercial and residential areas. So commercial, you have to follow what the other um, businesses, you can't be more restrictive than the other businesses in the commercial area. But within the residential, we can be more restrictive. So within the proposed code, we said 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, the limit on the number of vendors is not allowed. It really has to be related back to se um, health and safety standards. So we're not allowed to put a, a cap on the number of vendors. And then the types of permits that may be required. We can require a vending license. We can also require a business license. We're not allowed to ask for an outdoor, uh, um, an approval from a non-governmental entity. So I think in some places they would require maybe an approval from like the BIA or something like that for uh, selling within an area and that, that would not be allowed under state code. And also if they're um, selling food, we can require the health and safety permit. Also spe specified in the state law is that um, cities cannot require a sidewalk vendor to obtain permission from any business to operate near them um, due to conflict of business uses. So that summarizes the new sidewalk vending ordinance. Um, our recommended action is to approve the first reading of the ordinance to amend chapter 12.64 and allow the sidewalk vending consistent with Senate Bill 946. And I'm available for questions. Any questions of Katie? Sam? Yeah. Thank you, Katie. You're um, let's see. I had a, a couple of questions, and one I was wondering um, I saw the definitions of a push card or pedal driven. That's the definition of a sidewalk a vendor. Um, do we have the ability to, or would that include power assisted push cards or power assisted um, <coughs> conveyances? I believe we removed the ability to have power assist so that it would not include power assisted. So yeah, I wasn't, and I was, I mean, in reading through this, and um, I just wasn't quite sure, you know, where um, uh, that kind of, that came into play, or whether in our other existing ordinances w we have the ability to, to deny a permit or um, or, or stop somebody from using a power assisted uh, vendor card? Yeah, so a uh, sidewalk vendor. Is defined as a person who sells food or merchandise from a push cart, stand, display, pedal driven cart, wagon, showcase rack or other non motorized conveyance or from one's person upon a public sidewalk. So where it says uh, non-motorized, 
we could we plan to regulate that they cannot be regu uh, motorized via like or pedal assist based on that definition based on that definition okay um, and let's see my other question was uh, concerning the ordinance itself on page uh, the agenda packet on 87 4.6 64.030, permit required. Mm -hmm. Under B, it says an individual, no more than one sidewalk vending permit should be issued to an individual sidewalk vendor. Um, if somebody came in and says, hey, I'm an LLC of uh, vending um, push carts, um, hmm. do yeah. they, does that allow them to have more than one permit? Or how would that be? You know, we may want to restate that. That it says so. It says no more than one sidewalk vending permit shall be issued to an individual sidewalk vendor. We may want to say uh, to or shall be issued per business. Individual or entity or legal entity. Or legal I mean, entity. That, yeah. Yes. I mean, I. If that's the intent of, it's kind of like one uh, principle gets one permit regardless of their form of business that maybe we should spell that out so great catch and those were thank you so uh, this kind of breaks down into two we've got the ro either a roaming individual or a stationary and the stationary seems more tangible to understand uh, I, where I'm confused is on this roaming and and it pretty much the way I read it is if you're roaming, you know, if you have a cart around your neck and you have whatever you have in your cart and you're roaming, you pretty much can sell anywhere. Between, Get out of the village. Between out of the village. 9 and 6 a.m. Uh, 9, 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. you can roam. Especially on 41st Avenue. Mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, I, I know there's some restrictions in here in the village and the pathways and the beach and so that, but, but on 41st Avenue, if somebody had a roaming cart and they were walking up and down 41st Avenue, they could almost sell anything out of that cart? They can, but they have to keep moving. And if they were ca carry selling items that we normally restrict to just a certain amount of vendors, they would be in exempt from that? No, so um, they wouldn't be exempt from, say, selling cannabis as a roaming vendor, because that, that's explicitly called out in here of, of types of permits that we only limit a, a certain number. They um, and they have to comply with other sections of code. So, um, so goods that would not be allowed to be sold elsewhere would not be allowed to be sold by the uh, sidewalk vendors. Okay, that that encompasses it. That yeah. that the, the wording there would would prohibit that. Just seems like there's a lot of leeway with a roaming vendor. Yeah. We we can double check that language. I'm just looking for where we is, is that language that we can add on to, or is this language pretty much dictated by the state? No, we can add on to it. So I'm just looking for that section where we list. Is this explicit to cannabis sales? Yes. Well, cannabis sales to sell in the city, you need to have a, a cannabis license that's issued by the city, and we have two of them. So, I, I'm just I, I'm trying to un embrace this roaming because it just it, it just caused me concern. And, and if, if if it's if there's policies to protect us from that, then that's all I need to hear. Yeah, uh, I, I know it's in here. So, prohibited activities. So under 070. A4, it prohibits selling of alcohol, cannabis, sexually oriented materials, tobacco products, products that contain nicotine or cannabis or any other product used to smoke, vape, nicotine, or cannabis. But we, we could add to this something to the effect of and any other materials not it's when it says sidewalk vendors yeah. that doesn't mean stationary that that applies to both roaming and stationary the fact that it's yep 
because that's both. Okay, that yep. covers both. Okay, I'll make sure we're all covered on that. So we Thank have you. Two changes or additions. Okay. Any other questions? I have a few questions. Um, just the, the flower vendor in front of um, Wells Fargo. So I heard that person had a little trouble. Um, how's that going to be dealt with? Is this fine with him staying at that corner? And his flowers were on a feature, I think, of the uh, the bank. You know, like a place for the writing it off so that people could see plants and such like that. So that location would not be allowed. He's within 25 feet of an entrance to a parking lot. Ah. And if I were to receive a complaint, he would have to move. Um, he also tends to have many of his goods spread out. And right. here, th it's very specific that um, if you're going to be a vendor, a stationary vendor in one place, you're allowed to have a cart that's four feet long by three feet wide by four feet tall. So you really have to have a more compact design in order to be on our sidewalks you can't so he is he would be in violation of this code so a lot of times it's in the parking lot area so not on the sidewalks how's that so on the parking lot area he could work with wells fargo and ask for an uh for wells fargo to apply for an outdoor sales permit the or he could actually he couldn't do that with wells fargo because they don't sell those goods inside so we'd really have to find a flower location that would allow him to sell in their part, have a parking lot sale or have an outdoor display of goods that's in relation to like Whole Foods, they sell flowers. If he was gonna sell their flowers outside, he could do it, but really the use is illegal within a parking lot. Okay, so you're just gonna have to work on a few things. He is. <sighs> okay, um, on packet page 88, you're talking about the vendor, sidewalk vendor needs um, insurance. Um, how do we determine that? Do we have a way to determine? What, what section Can of code? You, yeah, what section of code? I mean, um, okay, um, what section is this? Page 88, section 1264040, and it's number seven. The sidewalk vendor currently applied for a capital business license. And, oh, excuse me, number eight, excuse me. Uh, the sidewalk vendor has adequate insurance to protect the city from liability. And I was just wondering how we determine that. It's, it's a rather small thing. Or is there some general policy we have for insurance? Or do we detail, um, like the size of the vendor? I mean, is there anything there? You know? So in general, when somebody, when we give an encroachment permit, for example, to a contractor who's going to be doing work in our public right-of-way that gives them the right to work in the public right-of-way, we will require that they name the city as an additional insured and they have evidence of that insurance. So for this kind of use, I don't think we've landed on exactly how much insurance someone would need to have. The fact that they're doing business in the public right-of-way, I think it probably depends to some degree on what level of risk they would pose to the city. Um, if they have a big cart that has flames on it, it might be different than if someone's coming in for a sidewalk vending permit, say, to just sell flowers. So we that's going to be sort of a procedural element of this that will be implemented at a staff level. Um, but we haven't figured out exactly what the appropriate insurance limits would be. And frankly, we would use other cities. I think what they're doing is a bit of a guide. I'd like to see that come back. I don't want insurance to be so onerous that uh, it basically prohibits. That's not the intent of this section. The intent of the section is, is to make sure that the city is not left holding the dime um, if there is some. So it would really need to be proportional to the level of risk that the city was subjected to. Okay. Assuming this gets approved, I'd, I'd like to see the actual wording and how we're going to deal with that. You'd like come that back. to come back? Yeah. So we Not for approval. I just want to see it. And then if we have some issue with it, that's different. So um, can I just try to restate yeah. it a little? So. It would really depend on, we were hoping to keep it more loose so that when a different, depending on the operator and what their what types of services they're providing, um, then like the, the risk of the flower salesperson isn't as high as the person selling sausages and onions that somebody could walk by and get their elbow burned or something. So really it, the, the intent here was not to tighten it down and to have prescriptive um, the other thing to keep in to keep in mind is that the liability landscape changes pretty dramatically over time. Um, as you may know, 
recently there's been a lot of cases against cities involving police departments and police liability cases the costs associated with them have gone up maybe three times in the last five years um, in addition there's been a lot of crosswalk claims recently with cities and, and uh, accidents that have occurred within crosswalks and pedestrians and so I, I it's not a static thing this is something that we adjust over time um, based on sort of the way the state of the insurance market and the state of sort of the risk associated with different times so I don't know that I could come up with sort of a satisfactory response on here's how much it would be because it would evolve over time and it would as, as um, community development director suggested vary based on the the proposed use okay I, you know sidewalk vendor is really not a major commercial entity and their profit or whatever they're going to make out of it is probably quite small and to have such a burden on them that would make it so they wouldn't even do it I think is against like you said the, the intent here so I totally understand what you mean about protecting the city but I'd like at some point to come back maybe the agenda item to give us an idea of what you're actually talking about when you're putting um, some content behind this particular provision only question I, I have a question oh yeah Kitty you uh, mentioned that enforcement requires a phone call mm -hmm. is that is that just going to be the normal process in dealing with somebody that may not be following the rules is that what it usually takes so if it were a life safety issue we wouldn't need that phone call to come in we could if, if I heard that there was something going on that was really uh, jeopardizing the life safety of our pedestrians we could immediately act on something like that mm -hmm. um, but typically the process is that a code enforcement um, a, a, some, a member of the public would have to actually fill out a form so it's not just a phone call it's a form and once the form is filled out it starts our uh, code enforcement procedures and it's just our way of documenting that the uh, code enforcement complaint has come in and then we'll take it through all the necessary steps to to either uh, find out that there isn't an issue there and if there is that we resolve it in a timely manner um, and does it require a constituent to know the code that the person no, might be breaking no they can simply call us and say I have a concern and we would say could you please but we could walk them through it and actually let them know if there is a section of code that um, is valid mm -hmm. but they don't need to know what section of code that is when they fill, fill out the code enforcement complaint we um, and also we never share personal information of whoever submitted a code enforcement complaint and that documents available on the website it's available on our website and you're know, welcome anyone's from the uh, public is welcome to come into our front counter and get a document as well. Thank you. Okay, any questions from the audience? Seeing none, bring it back for discussion and a motion. And if there's a motion, we have two issues to address. The legal entity thing that Sam brought up, and I think, Katie, you captured this, and Ed brought up, uh, I guess, further definition on roaming. How no, she clarified it. She, she yeah. just clarified it. Okay, so basically what Sam brought up was the only addition. I move approval with the uh, oh, changes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. If we could have just a second to um, draft the changes and then we'll oh, read sure. those into the record so you can make your motion. We'll Take a second. Change. Okay, thank you very much. Why draft? Yeah, the, the one note I had was perhaps just substituting um, entity for individual. Excuse me. <clears throat> Legal entity, yeah, something like that. In the section that um, council member story had, had pointed out. So within section 12.6403B, no more than one sidewalk vending permit shall be issued to an individual 
sidewalk vendor, comma, legal entity, comma, or business. So Sam, you're good with this? Yeah. Okay, great. So motion has been made, we need a second? I'll second. Motion has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So it passes. Item uh, D, consider an amended fee schedule, fee schedule for fiscal year 2019-2020. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this last item before you this evening is an amendment to the fiscal year 1920 uh, fee schedule. So by way of background, um, each year we review the fee schedule as part of the budget process and the fee schedule that we currently have in place was adopted by the Council on April 25th of this year. Since that time, we've had a couple of new programs come up and found a couple areas that need to be corrected. Uh, those include coffee fees, tobacco retail license, after school program, late pickup fee, uh, Jade Street Community Center deposits, sidewalk vending that we just discussed, and developer deposits. So for miscellaneous fees, the copy fees, um, we, the first five pages are free and we typically charge 25 cents per page thereafter. This fee was inadvertently left off the fee schedule for this year, so we're requesting to put that back in there. It's the same uh, fee amount as was in the previous year. Uh, for the police department, we have the tobacco retail license fee. This is a new fee, and it's set at $261, and we came to that amount by uh, taking one hour of a police sergeant time and half hour of an administrative records analyst time. For recreation, we have a couple of fees here. The first is the after-school program late pickup fee. Uh, we're requesting to set that at $1 per minute. Uh, that's to offset staff times for staying late for to stay with the kids if they're getting picked up late and it's pretty consistent with other after school programs and similar type programs uh, in the in the area we've also we're requesting to add a, a new fee event vendor fee of hundred dollars per event to help offset costs of getting uh, the facility ready for for these events um, a lost key fee this is also new twenty five dollars and it's just to recover the cost of sending someone down to get a new key made and then the last one for recreation is to uh, establish deposits for renting the community center. And the deposits range from 100 to 500, depending on how big of a group is going to be using the facility. As far as planning, we have sidewalk vendor fee, which was just discussed. So uh, we're going to, if the ordinance goes through, we're going to have a sidewalk vendor permit of $125. And we're also going to have a, an annual refuse fee to uh, help cover the cost of trash generated by sidewalk vendors as we go around and have to do extra trash pickup. Um, we're also requesting to increase the developer agreement from $5,000 to $10,000 and add in a new fee for developer agreement annual review of $2,500 and a historic in-kind replacement of $500 for getting that permit. And then finally, the um, environmental impact review or EIR processing is cost plus 21%. So when we did the fee schedule, like I wanna say five years ago, all of these types of fees that have like a um, management of a contract, we raised the, we had increased from 17%, cost plus 17 to 21 and somehow this one got missed and we just happened to catch it this year. So we thought when we were doing cleanup, we would clean up this one as well. Um, so the recommendation is to conduct the public hearing that we've noticed for this evening, adopt the proposed resolution, repealing resolution 4148, and adopt the amended fee schedule. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a question. Um, I have a question about the recreation fees. Mm -hmm. So we had received some correspondence about um, if our recreation fees would at any point uh, include a discount for individuals uh, with disabilities or individuals who are low income. And I see we have the senior discount. And so I'm wondering, is now a time to consider that or would that be during budget hearings to create a scholarship, much like we have a scholarship for our teen club or after school club? Uh, what would be the best practice for that? So we're also working on an overall fee schedule for the entire fee schedule, kind of a redo of what Matrix had done before. We're just doing it in-house mm -hmm. and that will come back to the council in 
probably April when we normally do the fee schedule. And Nikki and I have talked a little bit about addressing that, okay. whether it's through a, um, a discount or probably more, I she has opinions um, on it probably much more than I do, but, or a scholarship program. But we've talked about addressing that when we go through this fee schedule update. Okay, so adopting uh, these fees now does not um, prevent us from later creating new discounts or scholarships for these fees? No, not okay. at all. Thank you. I have a question. So um, was it uh, 50 cents or whatever it is an hour for charging? I mean, we have a charging station in the, the Novio parking lot. It's not all private. So I'm just wondering about what that means. Is that an electric vehicle? Electric vehicles, yeah. That's for the... What? That's for the ones up in the upper lot. Okay. And they pay extra for the actual current they draw. That's, a That's correct. That is correct. Okay, got it. So um, when Nikki did her um, food truck thing in Monterey Park, I mean, there's no fee for the food trucks that come in. Uh, that's our own activity. So we don't charge a special correct. fee for, for that. Correct. For that event, we did not. Okay. But that's something that kind of came up as we were going through that, is that we should probably have an event vendor fee. Oh, so if we, if we do the event, we would charge them? I mean, it seems to me, I think it was great we didn't charge them. Uh, I'm going to defer on that. So, yes, we would. I think that this is more standard practice for what jurisdictions do because the question comes down to um, the city's putting on an event and the options are either people come to us and get a permit to operate their food truck there. Alternatively, we're hiring them as contractors to come to our event, which implies a lot of things that get very difficult to resolve. Um, insurance for one, the selection process, revenue sharing, all of those things come become issues. So. Nikki did a fair amount of research into this, and this is what she's recommending as the me mechanism. And I think it makes the most sense, basically, where we say you can come get a permit from us to operate during these events, and here's what it costs. Okay, so they're covering costs. It's a little cleaner arrangement. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add, Nikki, but that was <clears throat> that was the, the stickiness that we ran into with this issue the first time. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Okay. Um, related question. Uh, we have a lot of control in Monterey Park because we own that land. I uh, suppose you want to do a, a pop-up event at um, Jade Street Park. Is there any issue there because it's not actually owned by the city? Okay. In that space, um, but working with the school district, we could feasibly do a food truck type event or other kind of events there. Okay, thanks. Very successful. I'm looking forward to the next one. Okay. So, any questions from people in the audience? Seeing none, back to City Council for comment and motion. Motion to adopt staff recommendation. Second. Okay. Been motioned and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, item 10, adjournment. Thank you very much.